Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Saturday the 1st of October. Now, I want to talk about things that we don't know about SARS coronavirus 2 today, some of the mysteries, some of the things we know that are unknown. And given that there's been an awful lot of money spent on this, it's surprising really how little information is in the public domain. So I'm hoping to be asking some pertinent questions. We're going to ask where the virus came from, uh, how come it mutates so rapidly, and why some people get so sick and other people don't, and various other questions like that. So it'll be a bit of a tying together, really, but really quite uh, some quite interesting points come up. Now, this is loosely based on an article from the Washington Post, but only very loosely. It's called uh, Virus Secrets, but I thought that was quite a good title. So 6.5 million deaths from the virus. That, that's officially registered. The real number is way more than that, but 16% of those have been in the United States. And of course, the United States and the United Kingdom and other Western countries have come up particularly badly. Russia is the worst by, by quite a long way. But after that, it's the United States in deaths per capita. So quite a lot to learn, really. Now, this is incredible. Researchers have published more than 200,000 studies. I mean, heck, it's nearly a quarter of a million. That is an awful lot of an awful lot of work being done on this. Four times the number published on influenza in the past hundred years and way more than any, any other infectious disease. Now, first question, um, where did the virus come from and why has it been so successful? Interesting. Now, um, I think I'll just show you a map here. This, is, uh, th this map here is Wuhan. So here is the Insti Wuhan Institute of Virology here. And here is where the, uh, the Hunan market, where the first cases were officially reported from. And we'll see that the distance between those is about 20 kilometers, is it? So that's the scale there. It's about 15 miles apart. So um, some of you might want to think that's coincidence. Others might think uh, it's too much of a coincidence. Of course, you'll have to decide that for yourself. Um, but let's, let's carry on. Um, th 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 this is uh, Vincent Munster, uh, Virus Ecology, Rocky Mountain Laboratories. Uh, NI, National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the United States. Now, he says this, we've now identified 20 or 30 of these viruses that all look very similar. So, yes, there's lots of uh, SARS coronavirus 2 like viruses. There's a lot of virus, coronaviruses that look like SARS coronavirus 2, but they are not the same. They are distinguishable. And what is true, what is the true hideout place of the progenitor of SARS coronavirus 2 is unknown. So what he's saying is that people have been looking for this virus in nature and have not found it. The animal source, if it's a natural animal source for this virus, has not been found. So um, that's one possibility. It's a natural zoonotic spillover infection. The other uh, theory that's talked about from time to time, of course, is the lab leak es escape theory. Now, there's two possibilities here. The virus evolved in nature and was being studied. Now, we know this is true. We know the Wuhan Institute of Virology uh, was studying coronaviruses. That's not a particular secret. Uh, that's known um, and have been doing for some time. And we know there's possible funding links with other countries that we're not going to go into here. But um, so it's possible that it was just being studied. And then it could be something as simple as a worker decided to steal an animal to sell in the wet market. That, that's, that's possible from, from the lab. We simply don't know that. Um, so that's possible. It was just being studied, but there was a natural leakage. Well, an unnatural leakage is inexcusable, but that, that could have happened. Or the virus was created in the lab by researchers. Now, the term created here is misleading. This is what the newspaper uses. Um, it's not really, we don't really create uh, viruses at all. What we can do, though, is genetically manipulate them to increase their function, to make them more infective, so we can study them more. This is normally called gain of function research. So gain of function research is clearly an other possibility, um, but we don't ab absolutely know that. So that's uh, that's one interesting question. Uh, how does the virus mutate so rapidly? Is another question. Now, viruses, uh, coronaviruses normally have this proofreading system. Now, this is a genetic uh, this is genetic apparatus, genetic molecular machinery. And what it does when the virus strings together a new string of amino acids, um, of uh, nucleotides, sorry, to, to make up uh, a new strand of uh, ribonucleic acid, it's checked. There's a genetic checking me mechanism. 
But this doesn't seem to have worked uh, very well in SARS coronavirus 2, whereas in other coronaviruses it does. Now, we know things like rhinoviruses and influenza viruses, the other RNA viruses, do, do mutate very quickly. Their checking mechanisms aren't as good, but for coronaviruses it should be pretty good. And at the start of this pandemic, we were told that it's a slow mutator, but of course it's to anything. It's anything but a slow mutator. It's mutated very rapidly. So why is this virus so different to other SARS coronavirus, uh, to, to other coronaviruses like, like the SARS coronavirus one or the Middle East respiratory syndrome virus or many of the other coronaviruses? Why does it seem to be different? It seems to be the odd one out. And there's not a satisfactory answer for that at the moment. So that's kind of an unknown. Why is the proof reading system so naff in SARS coronavirus 2 when it's good in other viruses? Um, so has the virus uh, evolved in immunocompromised people? This is probably true. So if someone's immunocompromised, what would happen is that they'd make a partial immunity to the virus, but not enough to get rid of it. The virus would then evolve to uh, escape that immunity. So there'd be random mutations within the virus. The mutation that would be su survive is the one that's uh, able to escape the, the level of immunological response generated by the individual. And after weeks and even months of infection in these immunocompromised people, uh, that they could then pass on a mutated virus. That's possible. Another one, and um, I, I think this one's also quite likely, reverse zoonosis. This would mean that the virus has got into an animal, perhaps mice. Omicron still could have arisen in mice. We simply don't know that yet. And then it, it's come back to humans. So the virus could mutate in an animal. And of course, the animal physiology is different to ours, so the virus could mutate rapidly, and then it could be spread back to humans, so-called reverse zoonosis. Also possible, we don't actually have a definitive answer to that yet, despite 200,000 papers and lots of money. The virus is found, um, this is not me making up, this is all the, these are the data points here, that's the CDC one, and this is the paper that deals with the, uh, th th this is actually a, 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 a talking about infection in deer particularly, but it does say virus found in 29 other animals so far. Uh, at man, uh, all all uh, mammals, of course. Uh, mink, we saw these appalling situations in Denmark and Netherlands with mink being culled. Hamsters were culled in... Uh, I'm not going to cross that because I think it was a waste of time. Uh, hamsters were culled in, in, uh, in uh, Hong Kong, which is probably also a waste of time. But lots of other animals as well. Cat, cats are quite a big one. Dogs are infected, but less so than cats. Um, lots of other non-human primates we've reported in the past on troops of uh, gorillas um, being uh, infected. The virus has also been found in uh, hippopotamus, manatees and a few other, a few other animals. Um, <clears throat> now this is serious because the virus can evolve in these animals and, and, and be transmitted back to humans. And if this reservoir of animal reservoir is there, it means the virus is almost guaranteed to be endemic indefinitely uh, into the future, unfortunately. Now, another question is, why is there such massive variability in the clinical picture? So some people, very often two partners living in a household, one will get sick, one, one won't. One could even die and the other be essentially asymptomatic. Um, why is this? Again, not entirely clear. Uh, why, why, why older people are affected more than children and younger people while well, younger people are protected? Why is it better to be one than 50? Because what we have basically is a linear gradation. The younger you are, the safer you are from serious adverse events of this virus. You, the older you are, the more at risk you are. It's a linear increase. Now, that, that's, we, we, we know this so well now that we kind of accept it as normal, but it isn't. It isn't. Um, so the 1918 uh, flu pandemic... Highest mortality rates in children under five and adults aged 20 to 40, as well as the over 65s. Just imagine if this had been the case in this pandemic, if, if we'd lost, well, I don't even want to mention it, it's too horrendous, if we'd lost several million children under the age of five. That's what happened in 1918. Adults 20 to 40 who had a vigorous immune response had much higher death rates. Um... So why is this pandemic such a linear increase in risk with, 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 a, with a correlation with age? Again, 1957 flu pandemic. I know it's another influenza, but it shows it's not normally like this. Uh, greatest mortality here was in school-aged children. Terrible. So 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-year-olds. And in young adults, 
as well as the elderly population as well. But again, imagine school aged children that have been disproportionately affected by this pandemic. It would just would have been awful. But that was the case in 1957. School aged children died, as did young adults. So, again, we don't know why this is. And it's, it's strange and it is unusual. You know, we, we, we're so used to talking about it now. We think it's normal. But in actual fact, it's not. So um, is it something to do with mucosal immunity and interferons? Now, this is not me making it up again. This is a paper in Nature. So um, it could be that young people, uh, younger people make more interferons in their respiratory mucosa and the interferons basically interferon is released by an inf virally infected cell it's a protein chemical it's like a cytokine and it protects the cells around about from further viral infections and the, there's indications that at least in the mucosal compartment the younger you are the more of this you make I, is it that it's one factor does that explain it all uh, not by any means so again it's a bit of an unknown um, genetic variations now, I just put one paper here, association between polymorphism. But polymorphism just means the different forms of the gene. So there's genetic variations in individuals. This is in PubMed. Peer review, check it out for yourself. They, they conclude genetic and non-genetic factors are responsible for the high um, inter-individual variation in response. So there is some genetic factors here. Now, we have to be careful here. Um, this is genetic variation within pupil groups. We are not saying that certain races are affected more than others we're emphatically not saying that and i agree with the youtube uh, community guidelines here which uh, i quote here uh, this is the youtube community guideline here and that's the reference for it uh, content that claims that any group or individual is immunity to the virus cannot or, or cannot transmit the virus that that that's clearly um the, the YouTube community guidelines is clearly correct. We are not claiming that any individual has immunity or cannot transmit the virus, but we are saying, rightly so, on the authority of many papers, that there are variation within populations. I think this community guideline came along in the early stages of the pandemic when people were saying that whole races can't transmit the virus or can't get it. Patently rubbish. So I actually agree with the YouTube community guideline there. Hope that clarifies that. Now, um, why do some people develop long COVID and others not? Um, like like me, you, you're no young fit people, um, or certainly young adults. I know several young adults really quite debilitated with long COVID. Um, why is it that they're getting long COVID? And again, it's not clear why. I can think of one case where the husband is quite debilitated with long COVID. The wife had the infection at the same time is absolutely bouncing it's there's there's significant unknowns here why does COVID severity different from uh well the, the age we've just talked about and from one person to another so so long COVID particularly now um we do know some factors here <clears throat> long COVID this is the office for national statistics more common in the sort of middle age group 35 to 69 uh, younger people, less than 35, less common. People older than 69, less common. Strange, but true. Females, more common. People living in more deprived areas, more common. Those working in social care, more common. People not looking for work. In other words, it's less common in people that are looking for work. So is there some socioeconomic factor in some cases, perhaps, but... In many cases, of course, it's purely biological. Another activity, more common in people with another activity limiting health condition or disability. But as I've said, like you, uh, we know people that are basically otherwise <clears throat> young and fit who develop long COVID. Um, and, and we don't know why this should be. Now, um, as time goes by, we'll leave this uh, pretty well last word to uh, this, this guy, Bill Powderly, Division of Infectious Diseases, Washington University School of Medicine. The virus is becoming more infectious but less dangerous for the majority of people. This is clearly, clearly the trend, isn't it? This is clearly what's happening, uh, thankfully. We'd predicted this for a long time, and it is happening. Uh, but he does counsel that we've no guarantee that the virus won't develop additional mutations that will eventually make it more virulent in the future. I think it's unlikely. Um, but he's right to say it's not impossible. But we do notice with gratitude that the virus is becoming more infectious. Uh, as the virus infects more and more people, it's going to generate more and more natural immunity. Uh, and for the majority of people, less dangerous, but still dangerous for the uh, minority. 
So there you go. Um, these were kind of known unknowns. Um, things that we know we don't know. There's probably unknown unknowns. Well, inevitably there's unknown unknowns as well. Things that we don't know, but we don't know what they are yet. So plenty more to come. Um, for the amount of research that's been done, the amount of information and definitive knowledge on this virus is actually pretty abysmal. So in terms of uh, bang for your buck, what we've been getting for all this research money that we've been spent, uh, I, I must say I'm disappointed. Uh, let's hope there's more um, meaningful data published soon and uh, much greater public uh, transparency would also be nice. So uh, we'll leave that there and thank you for watching.